The well has won me back. Tonight will be my first night under house arrest. First of how many? I scarcely dared hope they'd allow me to return. But when it came to the last night in the unit, I clung to the comfort blanket of my sleeping pills and section order, desperate to stay. Security. National security. Now, the well. Hard to describe in some ways, because it doesn't quite fit any one genre. No, it's part science fiction, part crime and murder story, and part an apocalyptic vision of what would happen to Britain if it simply stopped raining. Except in one very, very specific place. This story is about a drought. All we have to do is withdraw our intent to sue the government for illegal occupation. They'll let you serve out your sentence under house arrest. Deal done. That's what my lawyer told me. I asked him what was in it for the state. He talked about overflowing prisons and adverse publicity, drought, scientific research. I interrupted him, asked what was in it for me. It sounded so simple, his answer. You get to go home to the well, he said. Well, hello again, and welcome back to the Richard and Judy Book Club in conjunction with WH Smith. Introducing Catherine Chanter's The Well. Well, the next book on our autumn reading list is the debut novel, astonishingly accomplished, reminds me a little bit of Margaret Atwood, and it's called The Well. And uh, Catherine is here now to talk about it. And just, just summarise the, the, the plot and the story for us, Catherine. Right. Well, the story concerns Ruth and Mark, who decide to do the whole sort of escape to the country thing. So they buy a small holding, which is called The Well. Mm -hmm. But what they find when they get there is that in a time of increasing drought, the rain falls on their land, but only on their land. So they have what everyone else needs. And as a result of that, they become sort of subject to the, the scrutiny and jealousy of the local community, of the state and the government, of scientists, and perhaps above all, of a cult called the Cult of the Rose of Jericho who believe that the place is sacred and that Ruth is a chosen woman. So just, just to go back a bit in the story here. Mm. So when they move there, they don't think they're moving to this magical place. To them, it's just a small holding or the well. And the water that they're getting, which increasingly the rest of the country is not getting, and it's falling into an unprecedented drought, um, is not coming up, well, it is coming up through the well, but it's being fed by the rain. So it's not as if they've got a secret spring that goes down to the bowels of the earth. It's the rain that's doing it. The rain. Yeah. It rains on their land. On their land. And their yeah. land, therefore, is beautiful, green, fecund, fertile, um, while all around them uh, the, the land is barren, right across uh, the UK, basically. Yeah, gradually dries up. So um, when it finally hits the press, uh, there, there's a section where a, a sort of big national newspaper prints a colour photo. And what that shows is this sort of green, emerald, beautiful land in the middle of yeah. what's become rapidly a wasteland, really. Right. And so without any radical or, I mean, even adequate explanation for what's, what's going on, people, as you say, become very, very jealous mm. and begin to speculate that there's something weird and mystical going on at the well and that it might be something to do with witchcraft. Absolutely. I mean, it is an inexplicable phenomena. Um, they themselves sort of struggle with, with sort of possible answers to do with science and to do with sort of um, bedrock and water and that sort of thing. But they themselves can't understand it. And, and Ruth indeed often wishes, comes to point when she wishes that it would dry up there. Mm -hmm. Then she could be like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Because actually to be so different. Yes. Uh, is so difficult. Yeah. But it's not so fantastical, this, this idea that, that even today in the 21st century we would turn to witchcraft. I, I noticed quite recently that the, that the police college was advising investigative officers, if all else <laughs> fails, to take into account what mediums and clairvoyants and even witches might tell them in, in their lines of inquiry. So we're not, you know, we think of ourselves as being very far advanced from all that and we've left it far behind in the Middle Ages, but we haven't, have we? It's still, still bubbling alongside us. Not at all. And that great line, you know, there are more things in heaven and earth. Mm that are sort of dreamt of in your philosophy is so true. So when science starts to sort of crumble at the edges, yeah, then we're floundering really, I now, think. Now tell us about the Sisters of the Rose of Jericho, because this is a fascinating group, and, it's, and, and the Rose of Jericho is an actual, an extraordinary flower. So tell us about the flower first, and then these, these sisters. The flower, is, you're quite right, it's totally extraordinary. So when you hold it in your hand, it does look like uh, a bunch of old dry twigs that you just picked up off the ground grows mainly in places uh, in sort of Middle East, in desert areas. It has no roots. 
So when the wind blows, it blows across the desert. Mm. When it rains, even though it has no roots, it flowers. So it's a sort of gift to a writer, really, because mm. it's the most extraordinary metaphor. Mm. Yeah. When it stops raining, it goes back to looking like a bunch of old dry twigs. Oh. You can order them on the internet, as indeed the sisters really? do. Mm. And I did buy several, and I sat there in my kitchen watching, watering these things and watching them flower. What, what, what do they flower into? What's the flower like? What colour is it? There are different sorts. Um, the most common actually is really just green. There aren't that many flowers, but these green fronds uncurl in mm. a quite extraordinary way and really quite quickly. Mm. You, can, you can watch the sort of time-lapse version of it on the internet. Mm. Bit like when you're oh, sorry. A bit like when you're a kid and you you, you put those uh, little chemicals crystals into a glass of water, and you see them turn into a, a, yeah. a, a, an amazing magical garden. It's exactly like that. Or you yeah. get those sort of paper ones that you used to water that's as a right, child. Yeah, and yeah. That's it, right. It's just like yeah, that. Yeah. Only it's a real plant. So of course we, we therefore we have this we have this um, symbol in, in effect of. of the drought and then the water and the Rose of Jericho flowering. And these sisters, this cult of uh, nuns um, who take, who camp on uh, Ruth's land in the well because they're, you know, they obviously think something really mysterious is going on and they want to know what it is. And they, they choose Ruth, don't they, to become a sort of almost a saint for their movement. Yes, she becomes their chosen woman, really. Yeah. Um, I was very interested, I went back to sort of uh, medieval times where there was extraordinary mystics, these sort of uh, nuns who wrote sort of totally ecstatic writings, quite sexual in their nature, um, who nowadays I suppose would probably be treated with antipsychotics and, <laughs> and, and locked up. They would be considered mad. Yeah. Again, yeah. our ideas of madness change mm. over time, I yeah. think. Um, but that really interested me and I returned to their writings. And I also thought a lot about, just as sort of one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist, actually, if you were at the beginning of a cult, how much do you know if it's a cult or if it's the beginning of a world religion or if it is mm. a true faith? Mm. So it's a very confusing time for Ruth. It seems to offer her some form of companionship and belief and faith at a time when she's very vulnerable. And Sister Amelia, who is the head of the cult, is a highly manipulative and charismatic woman. Right, and there is, without wanting to sort of uh, destroy the reader's um, enjoyment of the plot, there is a, a, a horrible development, um, a really unpleasant development, um, which nearly destroys Ruth. Yes. And are we to think at the end, um, she does come through it, but w without giving away any details, are we to think at the end that she, what, that she simply learns something and will carry on with the rest of her life? Yes, I mean, she says at the very end of the book, um, I don't know, she moves on, I don't know where I'm going to live, but I have some idea of how I am going to live. Mm. And although I don't necessarily spell out what that is, mm. I, kind of having lived with this, this character for so long, I believe she has learnt a little about um, the benefits of taking a middle way, perhaps, as against sort of extremities, about... Um, small acts of kindness right. about selflessness. And if you had to categorise the book, I know nobody wants to categorise their own works, but it has elements of science mm. fiction, it has elements of um, almost um, feminist, um, and it almost goddessism. I mean, that, that sounds a bit over-fanciful, but how would you categorise this book? I find it very difficult to do, and, yeah. and this is a question I'm asked, because I, I didn't set out to write a particular sort of book. I got to the end and there was the book, and then I had to try and think, <laughs> what is it? Was. <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't set out to write a crime novel. Initially, I didn't even really have an idea of a crime in it. Yes, we have to say that there is an element of crime involved in this, yeah. which I referred to earlier by saying that it was um, a horrible, horrible event. Yes. But yeah, so it's that. So there is an novel. element of crime. In terms of sort of post-apocalyptic or dystopian fiction, I never wanted it to be the sort of uh, nightmare scenario. Yeah. I always believe, and I believe now really, that if, if something is going to go wrong, it's more likely it's going to creep up on us. Mm. Something like drought will creep up on us and we won't really notice. So it doesn't, I'm afraid, I don't have a terribly good answer no, for no, you. No, no, well, no, that's fair enough. I, I wouldn't know how to Just one more thing. Do you, do, you, do you feel that it could have worked anywhere else but this country because of our extraordinary relationship with the weather? I mean, I'm, I don't know, I wouldn't be rude enough to suggest it, but I'm old enough to remember the 1976 
drought. <laughs> yes, they which, were. Right, <laughs> and, and, it, and people got frightened. Um, the country actually began, rather than enjoying it, to, to become oppressed by it and worried by it. Yeah. There were even fanciful theories that the earth had tilted on its axis because day after day went by with no rain, with yeah. sunshine. Do you think that, that there's something about the, the British that makes a story like this work rather well? I think it does. I mean, even our rain, our language is sort of rain soaked. Mm. You know, we have a most amazing wealth of words for rain and drizzle and showers and raining cats and dogs and all the rest mm. of it. So I think it is something particularly about England where, A, we're very obsessed with the weather and where rain mm. is so much of what we live with. It is interesting because it, it is published in other parts of the world. So mm. getting responses from, say, places like California who are living through their own very difficult course, drought. Yeah. Um, mm. It's clear from readers there that they, they really feel it quite painfully. Sort mm. of, uh, one of them quoted the section where Ruth deliberately just turns on the taps and watches the water run away in mm. a way in a hope of getting rid of the water. <laughs> and they find that actually quite difficult to read mm. because yes. it's so close to home. Absolutely. Mm. Well, well, that was fascinating. Thank it you. It is fascinating. The, the book is wonderful. Um, it's the well. Um, it's on sale right now, well, everywhere, but in particular at W. H. Smith. And if you do buy your copy from W. H. Smith, you will find uh, stuff that you won't find in any other outlet. You'll get uh, extra value, as we call it, in the back of the book, which includes a Q&A uh, with questions and answers that we haven't gone through here with the author, and lots more. Uh, but above all, enjoy the story, because it is an extraordinary tale. <laughs> The ideas I had to start with were actually for short stories. I, I was playing with some ideas for a short story about a, a chosen woman and I had another idea about a short story about a drought. Um, but once I started writing, it became clear that the ideas I had were not going to be contained in a short story and they grew. And then I thought about a novella and then it was clear it wasn't going to be contained in that either. And I knew then that I had a much bigger piece of work on my hands. Writing the first draft of The Well, I didn't really know how it was going to end. Uh, the idea for the ending came to me, and as I wrote the last sort of page, I felt an enormous sense of relief that I'd found a way to finish that I was happy with, but actually an enormous sense of sadness that I knew I had written the last word. So it was a very double-edged sword, really. Once I start writing, I love it. I'm in a different place, I'm in a different space, I can write for hours and have no idea how much time has passed uh, and I'm lost in my writing. Getting started is harder. I will find a million and one ways to avoid putting that first word on the page but once I've done it I write very quickly and I love every minute of it. That of course is the process of the first draft. The hard graft of going back over it and making sure that every single word is earning its living. That's probably more tortuous and feels more like work. I love this book. It's a really interesting and very unusual book. It reminded me more than anything of Margaret Atwood's famous book, The Handmaid's Tale, which was set in an apocalyptic USA, future uh, America, um, where kind of the sexual politics have meant that men are in charge and women are either their wives or their handmaids. And this book, The Well, reminded me very much of that very feminine female perspective. It's about women, this book. It's about a particular woman, a woman called Ruth. Um, she and her husband relocate from a, this is a normal day, this is present day England. Uh, they relocate from their fashionable home in London to buy, you know, everyone's dream, a small holding on the borders of Wales. Uh, it's called The Well. The house and the land is called The Well. It's very, very beautiful and very, very pretty. I liked it for its predictive qualities, or its kind of pseudo-predictive qualities. For example, I mean, there are those of us uh, listening to this and speaking on this who are old enough to remember the summer of 76, which was one of the hottest, longest, driest summers in the UK's history. And I remember as a, as a young teenage reporter, 19-year-old reporter up in the Lake District, that uh, that people were getting very frightened. Rather than sort of welcoming this this manna from heaven, as it were, into terms of this endless sunshine with, with open arms, within about four or five weeks, people started to get quite spooked mm -hmm. and quite superstitious and all sorts of crackpot theories were starting to be advanced in serious newspapers about why the weather seemed to be stuck in this uh, Mediterranean pattern in the UK and with no sign of it ending. I mean, you were pregnant with twins at the time and you were quite spooked, didn't you? I was very pregnant. It was my, uh, it was my first pregnancy and I couldn't believe that it didn't rain. And when you're pregnant, you're a bit 
bonkers anyway, and you, all your emotions are kind of to the fore. And and you're, I kept thinking, I'm, my my baby is, or as I thought at the time, baby uh, is going to be born into a world that's completely changed, mm. a, a world that is more like Spain than Britain. And I hated it. I was really anxious. So Catherine Chant has done very very well to kind of tap into those fears and almost superstitions just beneath the surface. All of us at all times. Doesn't matter that it's the twenty first century now. Doesn't matter. We're still prone to those things. And she brings it out in the book. There are there are claims that witchcraft is 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 being invoked because the well because the well is the one place in the UK which still re retains a steady supply of rain. It rains every night in abundance. Everywhere else, even just down the road, the next field, everywhere else is barren and brown and drought stricken, but the well is beautiful and green and fertile and fecund. And people begin to think, maybe it's got something to do with witchcraft. I have to say, and I wish we'd put this to the author when we had the chance, but forgot, uh, I think this would make a wonderful film or possibly a Sunday night TV series. It's, uh, it's fantastic. In fact, you know what it reminded me of a bit? The old Quatermass. Hmm. The old Quatermass uh, stories mm. had that quality to them. Anyway, it's a fabulous read. And um, honestly, guys, you'll love it. Seeing my work in WH Smith's is quite surreal. It's quite overwhelming and there's nothing really quite like it. It's fantastic seeing your book on any bookshelf. The joy of seeing your real book, paper and board, on a bookshelf. On any shelves, bookstores, home libraries, libraries, whatever. I think I'm probably going to get a reputation of someone who's rather odd, who kind of hangs around bookshops looking at the shelves, because I can hardly believe it's true. It's an extraordinary privilege. When I walk into WH Smith and see my book there on the shelf, I feel obviously very proud, but there's also an element of shyness that comes over me, thinking, oh my God, that's me. When I was growing up, our bookshop was Smith's. The very first time I parted with my own pocket money to buy a book was in the WH Smith in Chichester. My first novel, Absent Fathers, I never saw any bookshelves. I think I got a royalty check for naught pounds, naught, naught pence. The fact that on publication day, there will be a poster in that window with my books on the shelf of Smith's, which was part of my childhood growing up, means everything. But I've yet to see someone reading it. I'm looking forward to that moment when I see someone on a train or on a beach reading a book. And we're on familiar turf with Joseph Kanan for the final title in this collection. He's famous, of course, for his book, The Good German. And he's back to Germany with the spies and darker elements of society for leaving Berlin. From the Richard and Judy Book Club, I've also read Gone Girl. And again, anything's been made into a film, you think, well, it might be good, but I don't know. And actually, I've got to say, gripped me a real page turner. This book I'm currently reading is Alistair Campbell's Winners and How They Succeed. Now, the name Alistair Campbell probably creates quite a few interesting images in your mind as someone who's quite a controversial figure in British politics. But this book isn't really about politics. There is a little bit, a few mentions here and there of Tony Blair and his politics and how, how that fits into his subject matter, which is winners and how they succeed. And he talks to a lot of sports people, uh, this book is called Night Music and it's by Jojo Moyes and it was recommended to me um, and it's about this character called Isabel Delancey and she is left uh, a widow suddenly and she has all these amounts of debts, sells her house, takes her two children back to the countryside where miraculously she's inherited this property and this house is falling apart. And so she turns to her neighbour, who's a builder, and unknowingly, unknowingly um, they have a particular interest in this house. 